Yeah, we are going to dis dis discuss a very important and a difficult subject which really divides lots of Christians. That's how we would understand the days of creation. I like, first of all, to ask you, who believes that God created in six days and rested on the seventh? How many people of us? Can, can anybody say yes, no? Yes, I believe so. Yes, okay. yes, I believe Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Right, okay, that's great. But there are lots of issues around this, this subject and the importance of the six day of creation is really, really important subject. So let us first of all discuss what God created in six days according to Genesis 1. Because I think we studied that in Sunday schools and probably just passed quickly through them. If I ask you to recite what happened in every day, I'm sure we will not be able to remember. But we'll do it in a simple way. Day one, God created heaven, earth, and light. Day two, he divided water above and water below. Day three, he ordered the earth to appear from water beneath and he created the plant, plants. And in day four, he created sun, moon, and stars. In day five, he created all the uh, flying creatures and all the sea creatures. In day six, he created creeping animals and man. So can you all see the screen, yeah? Yes? Yes. You all, okay, right. So that's day one, uh, day, day one, light and the earth. So the earth was surrounded with water. It was not just a hot blob as the uh, evolution theory uh, states. It was surrounded by water <coughs> and he created heaven and earth. That means the space and matter and created light and the earth. Day two, he separated water above and water below. And there are lots of questions about day two, but we'll come to that later. Day three, he ordered the earth, which is hidden in the water, to appear. And then he created the plants. In day four, he created sun, moon, and stars. And obviously, the planets that goes with every... Um, uh, I mean, there are planets rotating around the sun. So every star has many planets rotating around them, and there are billions of them, and the stars. In day five, he filled the sky and filled the water. So he filled the sky with all the uh, flying creatures, and these flying creatures could be birds and some reptiles, and as well, uh, he created the something like the El Khufash, um, which is the bat. The bat is from the mammals, but it is a flying creature. So all the flying creatures were created in day five, and he, cre he filled the water with many, many, many types of creatures. It's not only fish and whales and other things. The oceans are full of life, and we, vo we know very little about what's happening in the oceans. In day six, he created the creeping animals and man and woman at the end. And when we read in chapter two, <coughs> the details of creation of Eve, Eve was created in day six, not in day seven. Day seven was day of rest. So Eve was created in day six, but the Bible mentioned in chapter one, he created man and woman on his image. And then he gives the explanation in chapter two. And as we will study later, the chapters were, the division of chapters was not in the original writing. There are another words called Tolidot. Tolidot uh, in, in Arabic, has a kitab mawalid, samawat wal ard, has a kitab mawalid Nuh, has a kitab mawalid Yaqub. All of these are 11 divisions of the whole 50 chapters. So people, and we'll come to that question, talking about the events in chapter two is contradictory to chapter one. It is not really. Chapter two is backflash, explaining what happens in the days of creation. We'll come to that, but I'd like first of all to have a good understanding of what happens in day of creation. So what I'm going to do, I'll blank this and we'll try to remember it, okay? 
day one. What God created uh, in day one. Anyway. Sorry, Dr. Nagy, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is Megid. Uh, the question about the source of light in day one, although the sun and moon has been created in day four. Yes. We all know that the source of light is the sun. Right. Okay. Right. Let me just explain that now, but we'll come to that again. Yeah, sun. Right. <clears throat> Actually, light is different from the sun. The sun is helium and hydrogen, and the reaction of helium and hydrogen produces light. What is light? Light is an energy. It is photons, that mean particles, and waves. And this is one of the characteristics of light. So light is different from the sun. The sun now is the source of light. But in day one, there was another source of light. We don't know what it is, but light is different from the sun. So there was a source of light, and the earth rotates around its axis. What makes a day? The day is the rotation of the earth around its axis, full cycle. That way it makes a day. So there was darkness over the, of the earth, as we understand from verse 2, and the Spirit of God was hovering around the earth. So there was darkness, and there was source of light. So the earth rotates, so part of the earth is exposed to the light and the another part to darkness. When it rotates 24, uh, uh, full, full cycle, that means evening and morning. We will come to that in detail again and again, but that's a very logical question. So day one and day two and day three, they were enlightened without the sun, with a source of light, because as I said, light is different from the stars, from the sun. In day four, God created the sun to control the day. And then from that day, day four, the sun is the source of light. And it says as well, it is for times and seasons and years. You can't have a year without having the sun because the earth rotates around the sun to make a year. So you can't have a year in day one and two and three. You can only have days. You can't have a month in day one, two and three because the month is the rotation of the moon around the earth. So you have the month, the year from day four, but you have the days between one and three because there is a source of light. We will come to that again, but that's the, the basic answer, but we will address that again and again and again, Yansan, okay? Right, so let me just do the exercise that we were thinking of. Day one, what God created in day one, number one. Anyone can answer. Quickly. Light and, earth. Light and earth. Yeah. He created earth, the what? space, and the earth, and light. Okay? It's not only light. Now, day two. What was created in day two? He separated the waters above and the water and waters above below. And under. That's right. Day three. What happened? He... Yeah? Yeah, you you come nearer to their mic, please, Joyce. The hidden land came out. The hidden land came out. Right, I, I couldn't hear you. Sorry, Joyce. But day day three, he ordered the earth to appear, and the muktama al ahu biharan. That is the the waters became the oceans, and he created the plants. Day four, what happened in day four? He created the sun. Yes, yeah, sun, 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 and, and something stars. else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sun, moon, and the stars. They okay. are very important. The three of them. Right. Day five. What happened? He created all the flying creatures. He filled the sky and filled the the, the water. So he created all the flying creatures, and he created all the marine life. Okay, day five, uh, day six, what happened in day six? Men and women? <laughs> yes. The animals. Oh. Exactly, animals first and then man and woman. Right? Because you remember Adam uh, 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 gave names to all the animals and we'll come to that in chapter two. Right, 
okay, all of us together can pass the exam, but we need to remember them really. It's important, it is basic, and we need to understand what happened in every day. Right, let us move on. We will uh, watch a video to explain the meaning of the day. It will just take some time to start. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And no one's light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And God saw that it was good. The evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that has life, and birds that may fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of heaven. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas. And let birds multiply in the earth. In the evening and the morning, with a fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth a living creature after its kind, livestock and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after its kind. And it was so. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God saw everything that he had made. Behold, it was very good. The evening and the morning, the sixth day. Right. So this film explains the days of creation, and this is from the Creation Museum in America, and this is displayed in a wonderful big screen. But it is really an important one because 
God created everything according to its kind. When he created the plants in day three, he say it will bring fruit according to its kind. When he created the animals, uh, the, um, sky, the, the flying creatures according to their kind, when he created them, uh, creatures in the sea according to their kind, when he created the creeping animals according to their kind, and that's very important because we said that kind is the head of the family. So if there are 200 types of dog, for example, I think there are 300 plus, but let us say 200. God did not create 200 dogs in day six when he created the creeping animals. He created the wolf with the genetic pool to differentiate into 200 types of dogs later on. So the str I can assure you, Moses never understood all the genetics that we're going to speak about. He never understood all what we are going to discuss in detail about the astronomy. But because it is written by the Spirit of God, it is true. And that's amazing. This is not taken from other cultures or from other people uh, and stories and, and myths. It is written by the Spirit of God. So these are the six days of creation. I think we are familiar with them now. Let us come now to the definition, what is yom? The word day in Hebrew called yom. And what is the meaning of the word yom? Because this is really causing massive problem among many Christians. Right, let me just explain. The word yom can mean a period of time. When I say in the days of my fathers, this is not 24 hours. The day can mean part of the day, like during the morning time, during the light part of the day, that can be called a day. A day can mean 24 hours. How can we know if there is an evening and morning, and if there is a number, day one, two, three, that means there are three counted days. If I say morning and evening, that controls it to 24 hour days. And all the days of creation in chapter one in Genesis are controlled by evening and morning, first day, evening and morning, second day, evening and morning, third day, evening and morning, fourth day, and so on. Because God knew that in the 21st century, we will doubt the meaning of the word day. So let me show you another film, which is by scholars, Hebrew scholars and professors of language, and they are giving us the definition of the day. So listen carefully, please, to this video. It will come, it just takes some time. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. But what does the Bible mean by day? Yom in Hebrew, 24 hours or something else, an era or millions of years perhaps. The, the, the key is the context around it. Yom is the uh, Hebrew word for day. And uh, it's very much like the English word in its flexibility. When I look at the, the context there of Genesis 1, uh, it looks just like a 24-hour day. God is setting up, just like he does everywhere else in Genesis 1. He is setting up the world as we know it today. As a matter of fact, in the creation, God specifies each day at its conclusion that it was evening and morning, which consisted of a day. And so when I see phrases like evening and morning, the first day, and so forth, God is simply structuring days just like we see them today. The word yom, or day, comes up often in the Bible. In Exodus chapter 20, for example, the text says that in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Let me read it to you right out of the book of Shemot, sometimes known as Exodus, in the Torah. In English it says, remember the Sabbath day to sanctify it. Six days shall you work and accomplish all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to Hashem your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your slave, your maidservant, your animal, and your convert within your gates. For in six days Hashem made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. There's really little controversy about what the word day means when you get outside of Genesis 1. 
when you look at a passage like that, it, it seems as if it's, it's almost certain that it's a six day, 24 hour day that's being talked about there. These words were actually written by the very finger of God on tablets of stone. You know, we say the Bible is the word of God. That's true. And God moved men by his spirit to write his words and so on. But Exodus 20 and the verse in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is and rested on the seventh day and blessed the Sabbath day and commanded us to keep it holy and so on. That was written by the very finger of God. If we have a figurative day in the creation account, then the fourth commandment does not make any sense. How did Jesus understand the creation account? Did he believe that the days of creation were long eras or 24 hour days? The book of Mark, Jesus actually says, he made them male and female from the beginning. That doesn't make any sense if the beginning was billions of years before he made the male and female. It only makes sense in the context of the creation week being a literal creation week of literal days. How we read Hebrew, I mean, it just reads very naturally as a literal six day period. That's the way people have read this passage for centuries. Starting around the late 1700s, that's where you see people wondering about how long the day is. And again, that's going along with the Enlightenment age, the age of reason. We now need to, uh, reason is now the chief authority, not God, not his word. If the days of creation describe long eras of time before the appearance of humans, then death and suffering appear long before man sinned against God. When you look at the fossil record, it's full of death, uh, disease. For instance, uh, there's evidence of cancer in the dinosaur bones in the fossil record. There's evidence of a brain tumor in uh, a dinosaur skeleton. Uh, you see evidence of thorns, supposedly 430 million years old. Uh, there in the, in, the, in the fossil record and so on. And if you're going to say all that existed before sin, we've got a major problem. First of all, at the end of the six day of creation, God said everything was very good. There are some serious theological implications if the earth is, let's say, millions, billions of years old, and that we have death before the fall. Because the problem is going to be with the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, for by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. I mean, that's the teaching of the apostles. So it seems as if death is part of the curse. The Bible begins with Genesis, and it builds upon the teachings introduced there. Long ages would undermine the basic teachings of Christianity. <coughs> when you understand that Genesis 1 to 11 is actually foundational to the whole of the rest of the Bible and all of our doctrines, you start to recognize if you can destroy Genesis 1 to 11, you actually undermine the foundation of every single biblical doctrine of theology. And that's really what's happened uh, in, in our world in this, in this modern era of history. To be honest with you, if the first 11 chapters are not true history, then Christianity collapses. Basically, if you undermine Genesis 1 to 11, you are undermining the entire world. The issues of the age of the earth, the issues of millions of years and, and, and versus thousands of years, the, the issue in regard to the meaning of the uh, word day in Genesis and so on, it's all related to the fundamental issue of biblical authority. Do we take God at his word or do we take man's fallible ideas about the past and add them into the Bible and reinterpret the clear meaning of Scripture? Right. Again, this film is from Answers in Genesis from the Creation Museum in America. And uh, I hope you really, you, you heard this scholars, a professor of Old Testament, a rabbi and Kenham, explaining the word day linguistically, what is the language says. And, and if we deny what happened in Genesis 1 to 11, we are really denying all the basic facts about the Christian faith how sin entered the world, the effect of sin and the curse, the flood of Noah, and we spent four sessions talking the flood of Noah and the covenant. It is really important what we are studying now because these are the foundations of all our 
understanding of the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Any questions at this stage? Yes, please. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, there is a part that he was talking about when Jesus uh, mentioned um, the creation. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get this, um, this explanation. Right. Yeah, I, I will explain that. When they asked the Lord Jesus Christ about the divorce, he said from the beginning, he created them male and female, and what God combined together, no one will make a thunder, right? So he said in the beginning, according to evolution, the beginning was <clears throat> 300, uh, about 5 million, billion years for the earth, and life started in 3.8 billion years, and then animals and plants, and then human came at the end of this part. So it's not the beginning. You see the point? So it, the, the, according to evolution, man and woman came at the end of this series of millions of years. So they were not there from the beginning. But if you go to the week of creation, there are five days before the creation of Adam and Eve. So that was the beginning. Does that make sense, yes or no? Yes or no? No? Um, Not clear. clear. Yeah. I actually, I got a slide. Yeah, the, Malish, I got a slide which will explain the part of the beginning uh, uh, about what the Lord Jesus Christ said. So mm -hmm. I'll just repeat. Uh, where is the beginning of life on earth? They say it is about 3.8 billion years billion is 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 thousand million so about 3.8 billion years when the water came on earth and then they say that dinosaurs came 240 million years and they were extinct 60 million years ago and then they say the human appeared on earth about 120,000 years they say the common ancestor came about 6 million years and the human appeared 120,000 or in other books, 70,000. So this is not the beginning. All of these timings are not the beginning, right? But from the beginning, God created them male and female. That is in, this, in the week of creation. I, I'll have a diagram here, Soha, which will explain that later. Don't worry, okay? So I'll, I'll just give you the initial understanding and, and we'll elaborate on that later on, okay? Right, any other questions about what we have seen just now? Actually, I have a question, Doctor, about, you yeah. know, when you said about the, the first day there was light, um, yeah. the third day there was the plants, and then the fourth day there was the sun. Yeah. And, you know, according to Genesis, it says that the first day there was light, so, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Now... Yes. Today, when we say a day and a night, we're talking about because of the presence or absence of the sun. And number two, mm -hmm. how can a plant live without the sun? So if the sun comes on the fourth day, which means that it's after he had created the plants, how would they mm -hmm. survive? So I mean, there's something here contradictory that I don't get. Right, great, great question. Right, let me just explain the, the first part of your question. Right, we, we now, because the sun is the source of light, we consider the sun rise and the sun set, and that makes the day and the night. But the day and the night is formed by the earth rotating around itself full cycle. Because the earth rotates around itself and rotates around the sun to make a year, right? So there is a movement of the earth around its axis. And this axis is 23.5 degree mayer uh, kida uh, because that will allow the seasons to appear, the summer, the, the, the winter, and the rest. Okay, But the day is the full rotation of the earth around its axis. So in day one, two, and three, there was a source of light, which was not the sun, because the sun was not existing at that time. And there was darkness over the earth. So the earth rotates one cycle. That means one part of it was exposed to the light and the other was exposed to darkness. 
And then when it completes the full cycle, the part in the darkness became to the light and the part of the light became to the darkness. So that is the evening and morning one day. We will have more, more examples and more diagrams to explain that again. But regarding the plants, if we say there are millions of years between the days of creation, that means the plants will not survive. But the plants can survive on the uh, chlorophyll um, uh, light assembly uh, by the, the source of light. It needs energy. And the, the source of light was there to do that. Plus, wait 24 hours and the sun is coming the following day. So it's not a problem for the plants because the plants were created, yes, to mature. It's not created as uh, forests and uh, uh, apple trees. And it, it can be shrubs which will, will grow and can be seeds which will grow. But the Lord in day six, he created or he that means at your trees in the Garden of Eden, right? So we have to understand that there are two sources of heat in the, in the universe and on the earth. Heat coming from inside because it's a molted uh, uh, core of the earth. So this is transmitted heat coming to the earth because without the sun, it will be very cold. But the source of light will be a source of light and heat to the earth initially. And there was no life till day three, the, the plant life. And wait 24 hours and you'll have the sun next day. So there is no loss. It's enough quick event. Does that make sense? More or less. But even, even if I agreed with your explanation, why would God do it this way? I mean, why would he do, like, do it like backwards? Why would he you know, like create the sun on the fourth day when we already needed it since for day first to, to, you know, to make days and like, like, why would there be another source of light? And then only on day fourth, he will do it. And why would he create the plants knowing that he, they will need the, the sun anyway? So why would he do it backwards? Yeah, it's not backwards really, because there is a source of light and energy for the plant for the first 24 hours of their existence. And the following be, the day will be the sun, moon, and the stars. And then he will fill the, uh, the sky with the uh, flying creatures and the, the, the land with the uh, marine creatures. This is the order that God created with, which is completely different from what the evolution proposes. It is not backwards, really because you have all this in order. You have the earth surrounded by water, and the water is essential for life, and the water is separated in day three and formed all the, all the, the, the ocean, and the solid earth appeared, and God uh, ordered the plant to, to be created, and the source of light will change. There was a source of light in day three, and the source of light will just change in day four. That's all. Yeah, but why so would he create a different source of light? Like, what, what's the point? It's like, he knows that he will create sun, so why there would be another source of light? We don't even know what was that. And we yeah. are just assuming it's not the yeah. sun, but no. we're not sure. And no. why would uh -huh. that be all that, you know, like all this, this right. chaotic okay. way of doing I things? See. I, I don't yeah. see it. Right, okay, that, that's fine. I can, I can understand your question. As I explained, the, the light is different from the sun. Light is photons and waves. It's an energy, right? Mm -hmm. And the, that is light, which is different. The, the, the sun is hydrogen and helium, it's two gases. But the reaction of these gases produces light. Take this picture to what happened in day four when he created the stars. The stars produce light, but they are just gases. So there is light more than the stars, the, the sun. So there is another light coming from the, from the um, stars in the universe. So the stars are source of light, which is not only the sun is a source of light. The other thing is, 
the moon. The moon is a dark object, but it reflects light. So we need to understand that light is separate from the sun. Sun is the source of light now, but there was another source of light. That's how God created and how he described his creation. It's not getting it backwards at all. Because as I said, the sun is one of the sources of light in the universe, but there are others. All the, uh, go outside at night and look at the sky. You'll find many stars. There is no sun at that time, time, and in the evening, in the, in the night, right? Mm -hmm. But there are other light. So we have to differentiate between light and the source of light. So light, God created light as photons and waves in day one. Because without light, there is no life, by the way. The source of light became the sun in day four, but there are other sources of light, which are the other um, big um, stars, which is to push, to put light on earth, right? So if we differentiate between the light and the source of light, we'll find that the problem is really solved. It's not creating it backwards. <clears throat> Because there is more than one source of light of the universe now, which is sun is, is the most important one. But the, yeah, two seconds, there is somebody on the doors. Two seconds. Hello? Yeah. Okay, Linda. Yes. Right. Hello? Right. Yes. So, there are more than one source of light at night. You agree? That, that's, that's correct. Yes, I understand the difference between light and sun, uh, the way you explained yeah. it. Um, but I guess I'm just going to have to struggle a little bit with the idea since it's a new thing for me. And I'm going to just, yeah. you know, I'm going to just... Uh, I don't want to waste anybody's time again, but uh, no, no, let's let's time. move on and maybe at yeah. one point it will get clearer. I will. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you, Linda. But all what I'm saying is completely new to what we learned before. Yeah. So it will take time to sink in and I'm very happy to continue the discussion because if we know the truth, the truth will set us free. So anything in the Bible has to be explained. So just, just take it at face value at the moment and we'll continue and it will become clearer as we move on. Yeah? All right, Thank sure. You. Thank you. Okay. Right. So if you go to the dictionaries in Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament, when they come to define the day as 24 hours day, they refer to Genesis 1.5. And another lexicon again, when it defines the day and the, uh, evening and morning, it goes back to Genesis. And in Genesis 1, verse 5, 8, 13, and 19, and the rest, God called the light day, that is part of the 24 hours. It is the light part of the day can be called day. And the darkness he called night. So there was evening and morning the first day. So the evening and morning were second day evening and morning, third day and fourth day, and goes on. So every day of creation was defined by evening and morning. And by the way, the way the Jewish people calculate the day is from the sunset to sunrise, from the evening to the morning. So the Sabbath, for example, Saturday starts Friday evening, and it ends at, sun, uh, at, sun, uh, at Saturday evening. So that's how the Jewish people calculate the day, evening and morning, evening and morning, evening and morning. We calculate the days here in the, in the modern life or the Romanian type of things, morning and evening. So we, we, we consider the day from the sunrise to sunset. They consider the day from sunset to sunrise. Okay? So sunset the following day, I mean. Right. Okay, uses of the word day outside Genesis. The word day was mentioned more than 2,000 times 
in the um, in the Bible in the Old Testament, and it always means a 24-hour days. So 410 of them were day plus number. There is no evening and morning, but there is a number: day one, day two, day three. Evening and morning, together with the day, it was mentioned 38 times. Evening or morning with the day, 23 times. And in all these situations, it means 24 hour days. Now, as I said, the word day can mean different things. It can mean be part of the day, just the, 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 the bright part of the day, the, the sunny part of the day, or it can mean an, a period which is undefined. So if I say, I went from from example, from your place, from uh, uh, Montreal to Quebec or to, to uh, whatever, to, to Toronto or anything during the day. It took me during the day, six hours drive, I reached to Toronto. That's during the day. This is part of the day. It can mean an undefined period. When I say in the days of my fathers, that means years and years and years ago. It's not defined by... 24 hours. So when you say day, you have to see what is the, the correspondence around it. You have to see al qarina what is written around it. So if there is evening and morning, that means 24 hour days. If there is a number, that means it is 24 hour days. Right. So let us concentrate on this to understand the word day, because I think this is important now to make that very clear. So the earth rotates around this axis. This is the axis of the earth. And as I said, it's not a vertical axis. It is tilted 23.5 degrees. So the earth rotates around its axis, a full cycle that makes a day. And that's very important. That is, that is astronomical phenomena. Right? Then, sorry. What is the month? The month is the moon rotating around the earth. The earth still rotates around itself to make a day, but what makes a month is the lunar month. That's the 28, 29 days. So the lunar month is rotating the, uh, the, the moon around the earth to make the month. What makes a year? The earth rotates around the sun to make the year. So from day one, you can have a day because there is evening and morning, because there was darkness on the earth and there was a source of light. And the earth is rotating around its axis from day one. So as it rotates around its axis, there will be part exposed to the darkness and part exposed to the light, and that will make the day. You can't have a month in day one and two and three because there is no moon. The moon was created in day four. So you can have a month from day four because the moon rotates around the earth to make the month. You can't have a year in day one and two and three, but you can have a start of, a day, uh, of the year in day four because in day four, the earth rotates around the sun to make the year. And you find that very clearly displayed when you read in day four that God created the sun to control the day and the moon to control the light and to be for signs and seasons and years, right? So you can't have a year or a month unless you have the sun and the moon, but you can have a day without the sun and the moon. I know that's a different concept, but, but think about it and, and digest it again and again, and you'll find there is great meaning in that. Now, where did we get the idea of the week? Why the week is seven days? Why it is not 10 days? Why it is not five days? When the uh, French Revolution happened, they tried to make the, day ten, the week 10 days, but it didn't work. The week is not an astronomical phenomena. The week is based on the six days of creation and the day of rest. You find that very, very interesting actually. Because the day is a phenomena. The earth is rotating around its axis to make a day. The month is an um, astronomical phenomena because the moon rotates around the earth to make a month. 
the year is astronomical phenomena because the earth rotates around the sun to make a year. But why, why we have the week? The week is based on the week of creation. And in the commands of the Lord, it's not only in chapter one in Genesis, it's all the Bible really explains this. Because that some people, as we will discuss later, think that uh, Genesis is poetic and it is uh, symbolic and all of that. And uh, Dr. Bassem explained that beautifully uh, during January break and, and explained all of these wonderful things. We will cover that just simply now. So all the uh, uh, day is uh, and, and the month and the year is astronomical phenomena, but the week is not. So when you come to the command of the Lord in chapter 20 in Exodus verse 11, when he speaks about the rest of the Sabbath, and he gives a reason, because in six days, God created, listen, heaven, earth, and all what is in them. All what is in the earth and the heaven was created in six days. That's why he gave six days of work and one day of rest. You see how all that is connected together. So there is no, the week is not an astronomical phenomena. The week is based on the biblical creation week. That's the verse here, Exodus 20, 11, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in it, and rested on the seventh day, Therefore, the Lord blessed the, seventh, the Sabbath day and make it holy. So that's an important verse. The Ten Commandments are not symbolic. The Ten Commandments are written by the, by the hand of God. So the Ten Commandments tells us in command number four that the earth and heaven were made in six days. Now, Genesis literal days. Yom divined literally in verse 5 and yom with numerical adjective that is number 1, 2, 3 that means 24 hours yom with evening and morning that's 24 hours yom divined literally in verse 14 so the word yom is exactly 24 hours and the question is does God really need time to create? not really because God is outside time we have the time yesterday, today, and tomorrow because we are part of the solar system. So the earth rotates around itself to make a day, rotates around the sun to make a year, the moon rotates around the earth to make a month, but God is outside the solar system. So he is not controlled by time. He is outside time. And for God to create time, he has to be outside time. For me to create, to write a book, I have to be outside the book. So God doesn't need time to create because he's outside time. And God is all powerful. He can do these things. Because when we say God created in six days, we try to measure what we can achieve in a day. We can achieve very little. But God can do things because it, it happens according to his command. He doesn't need time at all because he's outside time. Why I'm saying all of that? Because we'll see on the 17th and 18th century when the idea of million of years came and it came first in geology, in ge in geology the, the theologians at that time started to insert millions of years among the days of creation because the language is limiting us. It is very clear. It is one day. It is 24 hours. And that is the evening and morning, evening and morning, and it's repeated in the six days of creation. Now, let us come to this very wonderful verse that if I speak about this, I definitely be assured that I'm going to hear this verse from 2 Peter 3, 8. The day in the eyes of the Lord is like a thousand years. So they say the word day doesn't mean a day because the day is a thousand year. It doesn't say that at all. It is the day with the Lord. It's not with us. And it is like a thousand years, as a thousand years. It is not the day equal thousand years at all. It is 
the, the apostle Peter was talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's saying, some people think he's delaying his coming. So he said, no, God is outside time. A day to him, not to us. A day to him like a thousand years. But remember, he said the thousand years like a day. So he really, that cancels the other one. So you can't come to thousand years and say this is equals a day. It is like a day, as a day, in the eyes of the Lord. So the day is a thousand years. It's not a day, a thousand days. The day is as or is like a thousand years. Right? So this verse is always quoted when I'm teaching about the days of creation. But this verse is talking about the second coming. It's not talking about the days of creation. He's saying a day like a thousand years, but a thousand years is like a day. So that cancels that. Right. Why we always question the days of creation in Genesis? So when we have the word day in any other part of the Bible, it is very easily understood. We understand the days. When we say Jonah stayed three days, we don't say that's 3,000 years. Why in Genesis only, when we say that they, oh, 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 what's the meaning of this word? We don't understand it. It could be millions of years. Because we try to insert the ideas of the world into the word of God. So when we read about Jericho and people moved around it every day once and in the sixth day, the seven times, we don't think they moved for 7,000 years. They would be like this, as you can see on the, on the picture. So when we read about days around Jericho, we don't question the word day, but we question the word day only in Genesis 1 because we don't want to accept it as it is written and we would like to insert the idea of millions of years, as I said, it happened in geology and then biology with Darwin and then astronomy with the Big Bang. That's why the Big Bang is against the creation week the biology, according to Darwin, is against, is, is against the creation week. The geology, according to Charles Lyell, and we studied that in detail in the previous sessions, is completely against the week of creation. Any questions at this stage? No questions? Fine. Right. So this is the foundation of our understanding of this. So what is the time since the first day of creation? We have the five days of literal days, and then Adam was created on the sixth day. You have a week, and then from Adam to Abraham, there are about 2,000 years. How do we know that? From the genealogy, which is mentioned in chapter 5 and chapter 11 in Genesis. From the genealogy, when they have this man begotten his son when he was aged such and such, and this son lived such and such years. So you calculate that, it's about 2,000 years. From Adam to Christ, there are about 2,000 years. And from Christ till now, just over 2,000 years. So the history and the earth and the creation is just over 6,000 years. Obviously, if you say that to anybody in a science classroom, they will say, oh, you are talking rubbish. But there is no evidence of long life of the earth, and we'll come to that with the scientific evidence later on. We'll not cover all of that today, obviously, but just to tell you that the Bible talk about 1,000 years, the evolution theory, which is the Big Bang, talks about billions of years. It's talking about the Big Bang. When they started, they say 15 billion years when the singularity started to expand. You remember that, we discussed that before. And then the, they reduced that 15 billion years to 13.7 to 13 billion years now. And then the stars were formed about 10 to 12 billion years. And then the sun, five billion years and the earth, 4.6 billion years and the water on earth 3.8 billion years and then life started from the water and came till now so when you say god created adam and eve in the beginning so the beginning cannot be 14 billion years 
You see the point that we're talking about earlier? When say God created them from the beginning, where is the beginning? The beginning is not with the Big Bang. The beginning was not with the earth, which is 4.6 billion. The beginning was not when Adam appeared, or the, according to evolution, the common ancestor appeared about 6 million years ago. Where is the beginning? The beginning is the week of creation. That is the point that uh, Ken Ham was talking about in the video. I'll come to that again and again to make it more clear. So the Bible gives a history of just over 6,000 years. The evolution gives a history of billions and billions and billions of years because they don't want God, they don't accept that God created from nothing. They think it is naturalistic way of explaining things. It happened as a normal chemical reactions. So the secular scientists, we, we say Earth equals 5 billion years. Universe, about 15 billion years. Now they modify it to 13.7 billion years. Okay. So there is a big difference now. We have two different starting points and two different conclusions and two different understanding of the whole thing. Let us see this. Have you ever heard this? Very Billions nice. of years ago, there was an explosion in space. Or 100,000 years ago, this happened or that happened. Or even in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Question, how does anyone know? I mean, was anybody there to observe it? Well, actually, somebody was, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Check this out. First of all, we need to recognize that there is a huge difference between observational science and historical science. Both are valuable, but very different. Let's define the two real quick, shall we? Observational science is simply when we observe something and experiment to draw conclusions. It involves repeatable experimentation and observations in the present. It's through observational science that we find cures for diseases and build space shuttles, stuff like that. Now, through historical science, we consider things that happened in the past, but they cannot be checked in the same way. I mean, we don't have access to the past like we do the present because, well, it's gone, right? All we really have is speculation, or at best, circumstantial evidences of past events based on what we see in the present. That's not to say that we can't make intelligent guesses about the past or form reasonable inferences from rocks or fossils in the present, but we certainly cannot directly test our conclusions because we cannot repeat the past. Got it? So, does that mean historical science is unimportant? Not at all. Let's drop an example down here for a minute and take a look at the Eiffel Tower. You know, that 19th century Parisian monument designed by Gustav Eiffel that stands 1,063 feet tall, which was built as the entrance for the 1889 World's Fair, and is still the tallest building in Paris today, visited by millions of people each year? Yeah, that one. Well, guess what? Everything I just told you is true, but how do we test it? Well, applying observational science, we can, of course, observe the Eiffel Tower anytime we're in Paris. It's here in the present. Then we can continue by testing the height and comparing it to all the other structures in Paris and confirm the claim that it is indeed the tallest building in Paris. But that's the extent of the kind of facts that can be proved by observational science in reference to this claim. How do we really know that Gustav designed it? How do we really know it was built in the 19th century as an entrance to the 1889 World's Fair? How do we really know how many people visited? That's all in the past. It can't be repeated. For that kind of information, we need to go outside the limits of observational science and discover what has been communicated to us through historical documents and eyewitness accounts. And furthermore, we have to believe those eyewitnesses and documents are trustworthy. The same is true when we talk about the origin of the Earth. The Earth is here. We all agree with that. So, does observational science confirm that the world was created by God, and are there trustworthy documents and eyewitness accounts that confirm it? Well, let's take the last part first. In short, what we're really asking is my original question, was anybody there to observe it? The answer is yes. God was there, and he told us how he created. He inspired people to write down his very words that became books that were compiled into a complete book called the Bible, which has been verified over and over again and has demonstrated itself to be totally trustworthy in all it claims and teaches. Even secular scholars will concede that the Bible accurately records historical events. Anyway, we have the most trustworthy revelation from the most trustworthy eyewitness. Now, what about observational science? Does it confirm the Bible? Yes, and what's extremely important to realize is the observable fact that the universe is logical and orderly. That makes sense only if its creator is logical and has imposed order on his creation. It doesn't make sense at all if the universe is just an accident of a huge explosion. Also, our minds are able to comprehend many things about the universe, and that's only possible if the creator of the mind 
gave us the ability and desire to explore the universe. It doesn't make sense if our brains are byproducts of chance because we couldn't trust their conclusions to ever be accurate. And lastly, it only makes sense that we can observe and repeat an experiment if the universe consistently obeys the same laws from day to day, which only makes sense if a lawgiver created it that way and upholds it. So to be bluntly honest, science itself, whether observational or historical, is only possible because God exists and the Bible is true. I could go on, but enough said. Uh, I hope you enjoy this film because it's very important. That's one of the lectures that we gave earlier on in the course about the historical science and observational science or practical science. And we talked about the science are two types. Operational science that we can do in the laboratory and we repeat the experiment and we have the same results that is observable, repeatable, and there is no contradiction between observation science and the Bible. Our difference is in the historical science. Things that happened in the past that we cannot repeat them in the present, it depends on the starting point. So the atheist starting point believe that matter is everything. So the matter is eternal, but matter actually physically is not eternal. Number two, everything could be explained by time, chance, and laws of nature. But that really makes the universe unorganized. At the end of this film, he mentioned few things. He mentioned because the, the world is orderly, if there is an order in the universe, that means it is designed. Number two, it is logical. If our mind developed as a result of haphazard reactions, which is not controlled, it is chance and time and laws of nature, how can I trust my mind to make any right judgment? Because the mind itself is formed haphazardly. So how can I trust the mind to judge anything? It's only logical because God exists. Then he refers to the Bible and the evidence of the truth of the Bible. And Dr. Basim obviously can give us more, more evidence that I can give you about the truth of the Bible. I have a lovely video about the evidence from the documents of the Dead Sea Scrolls and others about the tr trustworthiness of the Bible, the fulfillment of prophecies that written hundreds of years before Christ all these things, but that's another lecture itself. So he mentioned because there is a logic and order, because the Bible is trustworthy, and actually we cannot operate the operational science without having the laws. So if there is a law, that means there is a lawgiver. So actually we can't practice the operational science without a lawgiver who is God. So it's all fitting in beautifully with the understanding of the scripture. Now, Dr. Nagy, I would have a question, question, please. Yes, please, yeah. <clears throat> okay, if you say that the earth um, life is about six years old, that's 6, that's the 6,000 years old, that's the earth age, right? Yeah. What about the ancient cultures? What do you think is the oldest culture in the world? When um, I've been searching and, you know, some have talked about like uh, Middle Eastern areas or uh, in Africa or even in Australia, and they date those uh, old civilization to thousands and thousands and thousands of years, a lot more than only 6,000 years. How would you explain that? That's a great question, and I have a full lecture about this, but let me, I'm, I'm building that lecture just now, but let me just explain to you. The cultures from Adam to Noah was about 1600 years. So all the cultures that developed during and civilization that developed this period were destroyed by the flood, okay? So all the other cult, uh, cultures and, and, uh, and the civilizations developed from Noah's sons till now. So that's about 4,500 years or so, okay? So even it is shorter than the 6,000 years. That's I complicate your questions a bit more, yeah? So now, the, the cultures did not, and civilization did not happen one after the other. They can happen simultaneously. So there could be a, a civilization in China and civilization in the Middle East running at the same time. So when you calculate the time of the Chinese civilization, for example, and the Middle East, 
they are happening at the same time. You don't add them vertically. They are spontaneously happening at the same time. And the people who calculate these cultures, it all depends on the assumption that they started with. So take the, the pharaohs, because I'm, I'm doing a little bit of study about Egyptian culture and the time of the exodus of the Israelites, because that's a big issue. There were different, about 30 dynasty in Egypt, but some of them ruled in the north and some in the south at the same time. So you can't just add them vertically and say this is the length of time. So the question about civilization and cultures, they calculated actually in maximum 10,000 years, right? So it's not millions and millions of years. No, I'm not talking so, about millions of years. Actually, I'm not calculating it vertically either. I'm just saying that some of these ancient uh, cultures are dated more than six years, more than 6,000 years ago. So that's why yeah. I'm like, how, how would you explain that? Exactly. I, I just question the way they calculated the cultures. That's what I'm trying to say. Because they calculated depending on the assumption that they have a naturalistic way of explaining it. But take, for example, the pyramids. Usually, Sadat usually say the civilization of 7,000 years. Nothing like 7,000 years, about 3,500 uh, years to 4,000 years from now. And there is evidences, and lots of them, to explain that this civilization were shorter time compared to what you see in the literature now. And there are many, many evidences of, uh, as I said, when they calculated the pharaohs, they put them vertically. But when you put them in ruling with each other, then you will have a, a clearer picture. And the other problem with calculating um, a civilization length, if you like, is every pharaoh, in, uh, talk about Egyptian civilization. Every pharaoh destroyed the work of his previous one. So that is a big problem of understanding what's happening. Number two, no pharaoh mentioned his defeats. So they only talk about their victories. So there was a major problem as well with that. In a big uh, fight in Qadesh, uh, Ramses II, in Megiddo, in, in one of the very famous battle sites. He fought for six years, and he came back, he declared he is a, a, a victor. And the Megiddo people declared they were the victors. And they started the first sort of treaty because Ramses married the daughter of the king of the Megiddo. So when you study the civilization, it is not an accurate science like you go and check your blood and say this is 15 grams of hemoglobin. It's not like that. It is build, b based on assumptions. And these assumptions, there are major, major question mark around them. So we need to look at all this civilization from a different light, from the Tower of Babel and distribution of the nations. And you'll find lots of question marks about different civilization and the time allowed for them. This is a very important question, Linda, actually. And um, there is a lot of research, uh, many, many books and uh, references here, which I'm developing actually as a separate lecture because your question is very logical. Okay, so if you say that it's 6,000 years, uh, 6,000 years, yes. And then you said also um, that other Christians are debating that and other Christian people also do not believe in that uh, kind of calculations. So what is their point of view and how do they come up to their own uh, assumptions or their own uh, conclusions? Yeah, I'll tell you about their own conclusion, not only on the civilization, on the layers of the earth and the fossils. These are the bigger issue than civilizations. And this is the picture I would like to explain here. In the 18th century, the geologists start to start with something called uniformitarian. And uniformitarian meaning the same rate of change is happening all the time. They refused the catastrophic geology of the flood. So 
you remember the map that I, I, I used last, last week, or on Thursday, actually? All the Earths were together in the Pangaea, and then they were separated. If you look at North America and South America and compare it to Europe and Africa, you can put them together. So the distance 5,000 miles, and we are moving five centimeter, five to 10 centimeter a year. So in order to separate in uniformitarian, that means the same rate, that means takes millions of years. But we believe in catastrophic geology, which broke the crust of the earth very quickly. And then we are moving now with a small rate, which is five to 10 centimeter a year. So that is the difference. And this picture is very important. When the geologians in the 18th century, and the most important one is Charles Lyell, who wrote three uh, books about the principles of geology. And he explained in them that everything was going with the same rate that we are observing now. And he said, we should study geology as the five books of Moses was never written. He denied the flood completely. So when the rock layers came to say, we are, we are having millions and millions of years. So the theologian said, okay, let us insert millions of years in the Bible in order to match geology, according to their mind. They didn't question the millions of years and they didn't, they didn't explain the geology of the flood. The geology of the flood is studied very clearly in 1960 by Morris, John Morris and um, John Whittacom, and uh, John, uh, yeah, uh, and, and uh, jo John Whittacom just died about a month ago or so. And I met him actually in the Creation Museum. He's a godly, lovely man. But anyway, so when they studied the details of the catastrophic geology, which is the flood, the millions of years would disappear. So when the scientist in 18th century came with the millions of years idea in geology, so the Christian said, okay, let us insert the millions of years in the Bible. Where to put them? Let us see. We can put them between verse one and two. And that's called the gap theory. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. And the earth was void and empty and the spirit and covered by water and the spirit of God was moving around the earth. So they said, okay, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, put full stop. There was no full stop actually in the origin. And then there was, they considered the fall of Satan. And they considered this um, a time of uh, a flood. And that destroyed all the creatures. And then that's why the earth was void and empty. Void and empty is, not, is meaning it's not destroyed because the word in Arabic, khariba wa khawiya. Khariba is not kharaba. It's formless and there was no life because there was no life till day three when the plants were created and the real life came in day five. So that's called the gap theory. And then there was another idea, because there are pro major problems. We will study the gap theory in detail. Then they said, okay, let us stretch the day and make the day a, a period of time, unlimited period of time. Again, the language doesn't allow us to do that because you know the day and night and the number. And then they say, okay, the days are days, but let us put millions of years between the days. And, and that doesn't work either. And then they came back and said, okay, let us have all this is symbolic. Jesus, Jesus, a story to tell us that God created. And if you just believe that God created, that's enough. We'll discuss all this in detail. Any questions? Okay, right. So I'll stop with this because we have been working for about <clears throat> over an hour and 15 minutes. So where do we fit the millions of years? Somewhere before day one, but that doesn't work really because there was no time before day one in the beginning. The beginning starts in day one. So between verse one and verse two in, in day one, or spreading them millions of years on the six days of creation, that's called progressive creation and theistic evolution. And these are the topics that we're going to study in detail later on. Any questions?
Uh, I know today. We, uh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's a quick question. Um, sometimes I hear people um, like discuss the idea about evening and morning, and they say that they consider this as, as you said, a period of time. Like, yeah, he's, he, God was talking about a day within evening and morning, but these are like hukba. Like, yeah, this that's is right. when yeah. They, yeah, when he formed. Uh, light and then when he formed earth and so on yeah how okay. do we answer back yeah we answer back by number one the language the dictionary says day and night and number that means 24 hours day this is language that's linguistic you remember the video that we saw about the professor of hebrew and the rabbi and and um, uh, ken ham this is just linguistic so they can't say that the, the, the language doesn't allow us to do this the other way to answer it <coughs> is to go to exodus 20 11 when it says in six days god created the heaven and earth and all what is in them so he talk about six days of creation and what's all on them and then he say you rest in the seventh day so he didn't say you work for six million years and rest another million years it has to be 24 hour day okay so that's the two answers you can give number one linguistically we cannot put millions of years in one day because the language will not allow us to do this because if there is a evening and morning and a number that means by by the definition of the dictionary it has to be 24 hour day number two in exodus 2011 in the fourth commandment to rest on the sabbath because god is giving you the reason god created the heaven and earth and all what is in them in six days so these are the two answers that you can give now but as we progress you'll have more evidences as i continue with the study okay Asoha? yeah thank you make sense yes thank yeah you. thank you right any other questions before we finish right as i said this is a completely different way of understanding genesis 1 completely different than what we have heard in sunday schools in the churches and we are all affected by the millions of years idea through our education through the television through the films through the paper we read everything talking about millions and millions of years in the fossil layers and on the uh, mountains and on the earth history this is completely different so it will be difficult for all of us to go through this so i'll finish today like this and i like you to think about it i'll send the slides to basim soon and really i would like you to think carefully about all these issues and on thursday we'll continue another hour okay any questions before we close completely Okay, thank you all for coming today. And uh, next one will be Thursday night. I'm hoping to finish all of that just early April before Easter, really. So we need to put more of effort and studying and questions. And I like all your questions. They are very logical. They are wonderful. And I hope we can give you more answers as we progress. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay thank, thank you, Riyadh. God Thank bless. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.